All right, well, good evening and welcome to our July one by one community mobilization call. I'm Rachel Tutwiler Fortune. I serve as the president of the Jacksonville Public Education Fund. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us to talk about a very important issue this evening. As we get started, we're going to open up a poll to learn who's with us on the call today. We're really excited to join together with faith based groups, community and neighborhood groups nonprofit partners who support our public schools, business leaders, PTAs, and many others who share a great vision of public schools being as successful as they possibly can here in Duval County uh, to really make sure that every child is able to reach their potential and help our economy go grow. So just want to give everybody a quick second to complete that poll. If you're just joining us, just take a moment to let us know which community group you're representing. All right, we'll close the poll now and take a look at the results. All right, well, it looks like we have uh, quite a few uh, members of our community that are connected to school-based groups. We have um, also good representation from professional associations of the business community. Um, and we also have joining us tonight, civic groups, sororities, fraternities, and uh, alumni groups, neighborhood associations, and, and faith-based community groups as well. So we're really grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here with us this evening. I wanna again welcome everyone um, and just let you know that in addition to the Zoom call, those of you who are joining us on Zoom, we're excited to make part of the presentation uh, tonight uh, where JPEF is presenting its research live and available on Facebook Live. Um, so uh, you'll be able to easily share this information once we wrap up today. So thanks so much to those of you who are joining us tonight live via Facebook. What brings us together right now is the critical issue of public education. As we're seeing like never before, public schools are at the very center of our community and our economy. And they often don't get enough support for the important work we ask of them. As we work toward reopening, the condition of our aging school buildings is again an important issue for our community to address. I know that school reopening is on everyone's mind right now. So I just want to remind everyone that tonight we're going to focus our discussion on the half penny. This fall on the general election ballot, Duval County will have the chance to vote on a half penny for public schools. The half penny would provide 1.9 billion in funding to upgrade aging school buildings across our entire district over the next 15 years. It's estimated to cost the average family just $6 a month and provide an economic boost just when we need it the most. If you'd like to see the details of the upgrades planned for every school in the district, I encourage you to visit ourduvalschools.org and click on see the plan. So why is this revenue very much needed for our schools. State funding for school buildings has fallen significantly since the Great Recession. Cuts over the last 11 years have reduced facility funding to about 300 million per year for all district facility needs. Across the state, school districts have been struggling to pay for modern 21st century facilities as our schools continue to get older. Right now in Duval County, we are nearing a $1 billion maintenance backlog. We have the oldest schools in the state and every other major urban school district has turned to the community to approve a new source of revenue to support schools, except for Duval County. Right now, the half penny also plays an important role in growing our economy by offering an economic stimulus package right here in our city and by showcasing the quality of our schools so that we can attract more businesses to Jacksonville. At the Jacksonville Public Education Fund, we're working to close the opportunity gap by connecting educators with research-based best practices. A part of that is uh, really just participating in proactive advocacy for our children guided by data. 
That's why we're proud to host this series of monthly calls about the half penny for public schools. This is an unprecedented opportunity for our community to support public education. We are so grateful to you for joining us tonight for our July call. We especially want to recognize uh, those of you who are joining us from neighborhood groups, CPAC members, faith-based partners to DCPS. We know we uh, especially conducted some outreach to those groups, so thank you for being here with us tonight. And we're excited to announce the winners of our five gift certificates, courtesy of our partners at the Jaguars, to the five attendees who recruited the most people to join the call tonight. And their names should be listed on the screen now. Uh, Kelly Shaw, Amanda Crawford, Kathleen Shaw, Jamatoria Burton, and Melanie Pats. Congratulations and thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you conducting such great outreach to our community on this issue. To everyone on the call, we hope that you will help us spread the word about this important issue after we conclude tonight. We are only three months away from this historic vote. So please invite your contacts to join our next call, which we will invite you to in follow up. And visit jackspeff.org forward slash vote for much more information. In just a moment, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Elizabeth Krajewski, who will share some of JPEF's research about the importance of school buildings. She'll also lead a Q&A with two public school principals to share their experiences. Then we'll be joined by Elizabeth Anderson, Vice Chair of the Duval County School Board, whose leadership has been instrumental on this issue. And finally, we'll hear from David Voss, a communications consultant for Duval County Public Schools, who will share some best practices for spreading the word with others you know. And after we hear from our speakers, we'll turn to you for questions about the half penny for public schools. So please share your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll take some at the end. I want to thank all of our speakers tonight for sharing their insights with us. We truly appreciate you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Rachel. Good evening. And thank you all again for joining us for this important discussion. And I just want to emphasize that part of the reason tonight's discussion is so important is related to the impact that public education and schools make on the economic vibrancy and civic vitality of a city. And especially, especially for Jacksonville, who has for the past decade put public education at the very top of its agenda. For more than a year, our community has been discussing a half penny to repair and replace our aging school buildings. This issue has been decades in the making. And as Rachel mentioned, dating back to funding cuts during the Great Recession, and even earlier to the era of segregation when separate was not equal. Our community is finally starting to show the symptoms of a much larger problem lying beneath the, the surface. Some of these symptoms include the oldest schools in the state, 30% of schools in poor or very poor condition, nearly 500 portables spread throughout the district to manage overcrowding, no new school construction since 2010, and a maintenance backlog that is expected to reach $1 billion by 2025 if the community does not intervene. But beyond aesthetics, research shows that facilities conditions impact three important aspects of school quality, student education environment and achievement, teacher performance and satisfaction, and the social and community environment surrounding the school. JPEF's new research explores these issues and also provides information about how we can address the funding crisis surrounding school buildings and, of course, how you can help. Here are a few key facts about public school buildings that we're going to dive into a little bit deeper tonight. So these are about school buildings in the United States. Public school buildings represent the largest sector of public infrastructure spending after roads. Approximately one in six American children or adults spend every weekday in a school building. The average school building was constructed around 1968. And FEMA has recognized that in most cases, school administrators do not have the needed financial resources to address building vulnerabilities that could make them more susceptible to natural disasters like hurricanes. And capital funding for school buildings and infrastructure remains the most regressive element of public education finance. So first, how do school facilities impact the condition of the education environment and student achievement? The Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education in 2014 wrote that students are better able to learn and remain engaged with instruction in classrooms that are well lit, clean, spacious, and heated and air conditioned as needed. And Harvard School of Public Health has concluded that the evidence is unambiguous that school buildings influence student health, thinking, and performance. 
A growing body of peer-reviewed research is finding a relationship between the quality of a school facility and student achievement across different states, grade levels, and size districts. Collectively, these studies conclude that student achievement improves when students are moved out of overcrowded and degraded school facilities and into new, rebuilt, or renovated schools. Quality school buildings have been found to contribute to student achievement in several specific ways. They provide light, acoustics, and air quality that directly impact student learning and health. They offer inviting spaces that enhance student self-belief and desire to be in school. They provide technology that optimizes instruction and prepares students for today's workforce. They communicate to children that the community values education, and they provide reassurance to students that they are safe and secure in their learning environment. In addition to students, the health and satisfaction of the adults who work at a school can be impacted by the facility. According to several surveys in different school districts, school facilities can impact teacher performance and satisfaction. When teachers considered their school to be in poor physical condition, they were far more likely to report they planned to leave their school or the teaching profession altogether when compared to teachers and facilities considered in good or excellent condition. Just like students, our teachers work best in environments that provide clean air, natural light, and adequate physical resources. And this includes technology and related infrastructure to deliver a 21st century education. Researchers and education practitioners are recognizing the importance of school climate and positive school culture as necessary components to student achievement. Well-planned, designed, and maintained facilities promote the health, well-being, and performance of the children and adults who work in them. This is driven by mitigated absenteeism related to health conditions or illness, as well as motivation and pride that comes with feeling safe and welcome in a school environment. Beyond climate and culture, clean and well-maintained school facilities communicate a message of the community's responsibility and respect to students. Disparities in facilities, which tend to be higher in, in lower income neighborhoods, send disadvantaged students and their families a visible and unmistakable message that their education is less important than their more affluent peers. In addition to serving the school community, school buildings often provide emergency shelter during national disasters. And according to FEMA, older and less well-maintained buildings could be more susceptible or vulnerable to risk. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, capital funding for school buildings and infrastructure remains the most regressive element of public education finance. A 2016 study found that on average, local school districts are responsible for funding 82% of their capital budget, which pays for things like building maintenance, construction, transportation, and technology needs. And that's compared to 45% responsibility for operating budgets, which pays for teachers, staff, and administrators' salaries and retirement, as well as purchasing materials, curriculum, and enrichment for students. Since school districts shoulder the majority of facilities costs, Poor and low wealth districts are frequently unable to adequately maintain their buildings and grounds, much less modernize them. Therefore, it is unsurprising that districts and zip codes with larger proportions of low income students are more likely to have buildings in poor condition. Funding inequity is further exacerbated in poorer districts because they end up making expensive emergency and short term repairs just to keep school doors open. In addition to funding and other challenges, one change that has had a significant impact on the school facilities landscape in Florida is the expansion of charter schools. In the 2018-19 school year, there were more than 654 charter schools in Florida with an enrollment exceeding 313,000 students. That represented about 11% of the students enrolled in Florida schools that year. All public schools in Florida, whether they be traditional or charter, are funded according to their enrollment using a measure called full-time equivalent student or FTE. The state of Florida through the legislature and board of education allocates various pools of funding to public schools based on those FTE calculations specific to each pool of dollars. While several funding mechanisms for capital outlay have shifted more favorably to charter schools over the last decade, most of the policy requirements attached to that funding are the same as those applied to traditional public schools. For example, Capital funding is provided through state allocations through PICO and lottery dollars, as well as a proportion of local millage and sales tax revenues. Again, each calculated based on FTE. Capital outlay revenue must be used for statutorily defined purposes related to leasing and purchasing property, equipment, and technology. And annual financial reports that are audited by the state must be submitted and demonstrate how capital funds were used. Typically, capital funds are related to specific projects that a district or charter has requested. 
these dedicated funds can only be used for the approved project purpose. Traditional public schools must submit and prepare projects and master facilities plans in accordance with the state requirements for education facilities, also known as SREF. The Office of Educational Facilities reviews these district plans at the state level and identifies opportunities for additional efficiency and then makes recommendations about which projects to fund to the governor, legislature, and board of education. School boards can adopt specific exemptions to SREF so long as the applicable regional planning council determines that there is sufficiency, sufficient emergency shelter capacity within that school district. As with much of the state education code, charter schools are exempt from SREF requirements. And this is really the most significant difference between traditional and charter schools with regard to facilities. The other is that school districts must demonstrate need for additional capacity when seeking to build new facilities or expand permanent square footage. The formulas used to calculate need can be particularly challenging in a district of our size. And this is part of the reason why DCPS has recommended school closures and consolidations in conjunction with the half penny effort. Of course, another reason being greater efficiency and utilization rates. <clears throat> so all of this to say that Duval County is not unique in its need for improved school buildings and funding to support that improvement. A facility study conducted by DCPS has shown that the schools with the greatest deterioration are in high poverty areas in Northwest Jacksonville. The district has also recently estimated that about $500,000 per month is spent on Band-Aid type repairs. Jacksonville cannot move forward toward our goals as a community unless and until we address the needs of our public school buildings. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really appreciate your thoughtful analysis of this very important issue. It's so important to keep student achievement first and foremost in these conversations. But before we turn to our principals, I want to thank our Facebook audience for watching. We appreciate you tuning into our research presentation, and we hope you'll join our next call in August to participate in this ongoing conversation as we prepare to support the half penny on the November ballot. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so in order to help bring some real world context to all of this research, we are joined this evening by two Duval County principals, Principal Jacqueline Jones and Principal Cimarron Bakshi. Principal Jacqueline Jones will be principal of Westview in the upcoming school year and was previously the principal of Brentwood Elementary. Principal Jones was the inaugural fellow of the Nina Waters Fellowship for Leadership and Management, part of JPEF's school leadership initiative. Principal Bakshi is currently the principal of Wayman Academy of the Arts. She was selected for a 2019-20 Florida Tax Watch Principal Leadership Award in recognition of her school's success, and she is currently participating in JPEF's School Leadership Initiative Summer Residency Program. Thank you both for joining us this evening. I'm so excited to hear from both of you. Um, and I really want to start our discussion by talking about your schools and what you've accomplished with student achievement. So Principal Jones, I would like to start with you. Could you share a little bit about Brentwood and what you accomplished with your team as principal there? Absolutely, and thank you for asking. When I arrived at Brentwood four years ago, students' reading achievement was at 26% and their math achievement was at 35%. Upon the last year of testing, we were at 42% in reading proficiency and 72% in math. That did not come easy. And I will tell you one of the first variables that I worked on as a leader of the school was ensuring that the space in the school was welcoming, safe, clean for students and teachers. That was key and important because of the age of the building and what we walked into at the time. Thank you so much, Principal Jones, and fantastic success at Brentwood. Thank you so much. Uh, Principal Bakshi, could you tell us a little bit about your work at Wayman Academy? Sure. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, Wayman Academy is a K-5 elementary charter school on the west side of the town. The school celebrated its 20th anniversary just last school year, so this will be our 21st going into the um, 2021 school year. And um, Wayman is also the oldest elementary charter school in Jacksonville. Um, the building was an older church building, which was built 30 years or more ago. And um, as I said, the school is located on the west side of the city near Cassett Avenue. I'm very proud to say that we are an A school. Uh, we have been an AB honor roll school since last four years. 
and we are also a high performing school. Um, I'm very, very proud of my teachers as they provide stellar education to all our students and they always put their students first before their own needs. So that's all I'm, and the culture of the school. I'm very proud of that. They're my family and I cannot live without them. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited that both of you are here. And I want to now shift to talk about the condition of your school facility and some of the more pressing needs that you feel you have. So Principal Jones, we'll start with you. What are some of the pressing needs you dealt with at Brentwood? So upon entry, one of the major projects that needed to be addressed was flooring. We had many classrooms, um, offices, and classroom spaces that had termite damage, um, that had very old uh, carpeting as the building is 105 years old. And so there was a lot of work that needed to be done with that. And as the district did an amazing job responding to some of the needs and the requests, however, when they went in, the projects became larger than the initial, initial view because of the damage that was underneath some of those uh, floors. So more work needed to happen, more money needed to be spent, um, and the projects and getting ready for classroom instruction and teaching turned to maybe what we thought would be a week or two projects until sometimes almost a month um, to get some of the projects done. We also had a lot of old um, uh, furniture or materials that was important to student learning and instruction in the classrooms. And I will tell you, I always honor the teachers and I would tell them they would just seethe quietly because they would just keep functioning. I, I remember a, a scenario where I walked to the classroom and there was a desk that was literally just lopsided and they were just continuing teaching. <laughs> like They were just going to go forward. They had the student's attention. And I just thought as the leader, I wanted to make sure that they did not have to worry about those types of things. And so to ensure that they didn't even have to think about it, those were always key points that I looked around the spaces of the school to ensure that they had the best of everything they could possibly have. Thank you so much, Principal Jones. Principal Bakshi, what is the facility situation at Wayman? Um, Everything that Ms. Jones said, you know, that's a struggle for all of us. And I wish I could tell my teachers that, okay, I could provide my teachers everything they ask for because of course they deserve the very best as well. Um, but I'll start by saying that Wayman has not allowed um, the age of the building to influence student performance at all. Um, but we do struggle due to the lack of funds to renovate or modernize our aging buildings. Uh, my students and teachers, they hold themselves up, you know, up for high expectations and made us all very proud. And it is but unfair that they still have to face, you know, some of the challenges like air conditioners going out unexpectedly. They have to move classrooms when roofs leak, when storms hit, uh, when bathrooms are shut down due to plumbing issues. Um, so as you all know, time is of essence in the classrooms and when precious hours are um, wasted and scrambling out to move to different classrooms and learning suffers tremendously. Um, I worry that in future, these pressing issues will have a negative influence on the learning climate of the school. And another persistent need in today's day amidst the COVID-19 situation, you all know, is the size of instructional space for effective teaching and need for social distancing. Um, I worry about that. I do not know how will we do it. Uh, we do not know what the future holds, but if the demand is for us to be prepared for unforeseen situations like today, then the need to upgrade the buildings is greater than ever before. Absolutely, thank you. And I think both of you touched on my next question just a little bit already, but I wanna dig in a little bit more. Uh, much of the research presented today discussed the impact of school facilities on a school community. Um, and both of you, I think, mentioned some examples of how you've observed some disruption in the classroom. Um, but can you talk about how that really, how you've observed that impact your students, teachers, and also the school community? Um, and Principal Bakshi, let's start with you. Okay. So I have seen it firsthand that due to lack of access to capital dollars or extra dollars, we have ended up making more expensive and temporary repairs out of our operation budgets. Like you said in your um, research, Band-Aid. 
uh, the same money that could have been used to pay teachers more or stipends or purchase extra resources for students or other necessary requirements, better science lab or a better media center. We have spent a higher proportion of the education budget, which should have gone towards educating students on daily upkeep and repair of our facilities. Also with the latest uh, you know, safety and security requirements, older buildings, my building, we cannot compete with the newly constructed buildings at all. And also the upkeep of technology infrastructure has become a major obstacle for us too, especially during these times. So it's not just one little thing, it's, it's an accumulation of all of these things that really press hard on the needs that we have today and the dollars that we just, I've spent nights staring at those small pot of dollars that we have left and we have so many needs that we need to take care of. Thank you, and Principal Jones. So that question reminds me of two major projects that happened at Brentwood under my tenure. We had to have a full electrical remake of the school. Um, and it was a summer project that did extend quite lengthy um, of time because of the age of the building. The things that needed to be replaced or repaired and rewired because of the age and where things originally had been infrastructured, as well as the air conditioning that was associated with the electric. And that then also fed into our fire drill system. Um, so within just those two projects, it affected multiple things that was happening. Everything from the custodial staff working through the dark and heat and sweltering summer because of the electrical project that needed to take place. And our students, as mentioned earlier, having to move classrooms or work in classrooms with the windows open or the doors open to provide some air because as Mrs. Uh, uh, Barachi said, that whenever you have a smaller school as well, there's not a lot of space to move children children around and if the AC unit is out where are you going to move all of the classes and the students so we had to begin to open up doors and windows and I will tell you the other thing that sometimes that brings out are rodents and critters uh, as the age of the building and that heat um, begin to invade our time of instruction and learning and that happened within the four years that I was there and within at least two summers in a school year. Oh, wow, thank you both so much. I wanna la ask each of you one more question, but I want it to be a little bit more specific um, to your school. So Principal Jones, of course, you're transitioning to Westview this year, um, which is a newer facility. Can you share a little bit about what it's like to now be working in a more modern school facility and what you think that offers your students that maybe wasn't available to them in an older building, like uh, one like Brentwood? Well, I will tell you, I have been um, in a little bit more heaven uh, with this new move and the building only being 10 and a half years old. Just the sheer opportunity for the technology and resources that are built into the building and that was more current. Um, and considered because the building's age, um, a lot of the work that I would have to do each summer or in preparation or during the year at Brentwood, I'm not finding myself doing. I can focus more on just the touch up paint, maybe making sure we have enough desk or things like that in particular rooms. And I can truly focus on the safety of you know, our code reds, code yellows in instruction and learning. I don't have to worry about as much as I did when I was at Brentwood. Thank you so much, Principal Jones. And Principal Bakshi, my last question is for you. What challenges, um, and I think you talked about the, the current challenges with your facilities needs and budget, um, but what about, um, you know, with the half penny revenue, how do you see that really changing things for Wayman's facility? Um, I'm excited about that, actually. So, you know, if it goes through uh, with half penny revenue, our school, along with many others, I know we will be able to invest in what matters for students and their learning. You know, the classroom, if the classrooms always continue to transform as the needs of students and teachers evolve over the years, then why not school buildings, you know? Um, at our school, half penny revenue can assist, in, assist us in upgrading our facility with features that will fit, fit the needs of the entire campus, not just one or two needs, 
we will be able to retrofit our campus, including complex needs of some of our students. Um, and I'm not talking about luxuries here, but I'm talking about much deserved necessities that our students and staff deserve. It will definitely have a long-term profound impact on both student and teacher outcomes as they will be physically supported to concentrate on just academic endeavors and not worry about the other things happening around them. And with not getting half penny revenue, you know, we all know that improving school buildings come at a very, very high financial cost. But we cannot continue to push an increase in student performance. You know, we are always told, okay, better the student performance, but we allow our student buildings to deteriorate. One cannot, you cannot have one without the other. So without the half penny revenue, the much required maintenance and additions will be postponed. I know that. And it will continue to cost us so much more in future due to the high short term upkeep costs. Um, every day we strive to provide excellent learning environment to our students and believe that every child deserves to learn in a safe and comfortable environment. And half penny revenue will definitely help us in continuing to do the same in future. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it back to Rachel. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you, Principal Jones. Thank you, Principal Bakshi. We really appreciate um, each and every one of you for that deep dive into the facilities issue. We know this is an incredibly stressful time for our school leaders, and I think it speaks to your commitment to children that you would take the time to be here tonight to share your experience as the voters prepare to decide on the half penny. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Now I wanna invite Duval County School Board Vice Chair, Elizabeth Anderson to share a few words with us and her thoughts about what we've just heard. Vice Chair Anderson, we really appreciate you so much for being here with us as well. And as she shares with us, I want to encourage all attendees to please send us your questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having me here. I apologize. Um, this isn't a green screen backdrop. I wish I was someplace, um, you know, exciting on vacation. Um, I'm, I'm going to head into a graduation here in just a few minutes. So I, I am zooming from my car today, um, but I'm excited to be here with you all and for, ha for having this conversation. Um, you know, I think it's really important and relevant that we talk at, talk about not only um, the, the, the details of the capital improvements we can make, but really how those do impact children. Um, why, why have, how have we gotten to this place? Why are we doing this now um, is, is something that I get asked a lot. And I think it's really important to um, consider that our funding for public education has deteriorated pretty consistently since um, 2008. We've lost over $300 million um, in funding that would have come to our capital um, to our capital budgets. And so we've been trying as a district to, to patch here and there, um, as Ms. Jones, as Principal Jones said earlier, um, but we've gotten to a place now where really in order to take care of the needs of our children, to, to show them, as Elizabeth mentioned before, how valuable they are to us and how much their community cares about their education, uh, we have to invest in, in our children. We have to invest in our public education system. Um, the reality is school districts all across the state of Florida have already done this. There's a couple ways the districts can um, seek additional revenue for their capital needs. Impact fees are one way. The sales sur surtax is another way. Um, and most districts have done that. They've chosen to invest in their children and in their communities. And Duval County just has not. Um, it's not um, a step that we've taken. We don't have impact fees here. And so this is our attempt to help right the ship to help take care of those needs for our students, for our faculty and staff, um, and really for the future of our community. Um, and so what we're looking at here is um, being able to take care of not only all of the building and classroom needs, but as we've already said, in order for our students to be able to achieve at the level we'd like them to achieve, um, for us to get that last little half a percentage point to an A, to become an A district, these are simple things that will help them achieve at a higher level. Um, when they're not worried about the temperature, when they're not sweating, when they're not cold, when they are able to uh, use the restroom and, and not have to worry about the plumbing or um, whether their classroom is leaking or in some facilities, as we know, the, the 
staircase or the wall is falling, um, you know, how can they be expected to test and to be focused and, and, and to create an appropriate educational and developmentally um, suitable environment for children? Um, and so I think that this sales tax really gives us the opportunity to invest in our children and in our future in that way. Um, as Principal Bakshi also discussed, you know, we're, we're talking about preparing for um, how to keep our children educated, how to make sure that achievement gaps don't continue to widen um, during a global pandemic. And certainly more than ever, we're seeing that things like HVAC systems and proper ventilation and windows that work um, the classrooms that are large enough with furnishings that are flexible and able to be moved around. Um, these things are critical needs. Um, and, and at a time now more than ever, it would certainly go a long way for us to be able to make these accommodations. And unfortunately, our buildings are, are too old. Um, and over the years, the patch jobs haven't been able to get us where we want to be, where, where we would like to be at this moment. Um, so certainly that is something that impacts um, our, our children and it is more pressing and more evident today than it ever has been. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention is that the sales tax is going to help provide for technology infrastructure as well if you look at the language there. So we're not just talking about physical buildings, but we were able to improve the hardware and um, infrastructure for our technology systems. And again, today more than ever, we're seeing how critically important it is for our children to be able to be connected um, through in, in a digital age. Um, so we would be able to improve those systems to be able to do things like live streaming to be more creative about how to be virtual or distant um, in a variety of situations. Hopefully we don't find ourselves in a pandemic again uh, anytime soon and I would I don't know if I'd make it on the school board if we had to do that again anytime soon but um, you know these are things that are going to be doors that will open up for us, not just our abilities, but the technology that we're able to provide our students to help them learn in a 21st century environment is really critical as well. Uh, and then finally, I think it's important to keep in mind that we, we just closed out as a state our fiscal year, and the state is looking at about $1.9 billion in lost revenue. Um, so as we come into the next budget season and we look at what does the future look like for, for funding and for public education, um, I have concerns. Most um, folks are, are estimating that we're going to be taking some pretty serious cuts to public education somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent, um, which would be astronomical. So, you know, when we think about in 2008, we took big, big hits um, and funding has slowly deteriorated. If we take big hits now, it's going to really be a problem for the future of our, of our public education system and, and our ability to continue to make these patches is going to be a challenge. Um, so it's really important that we invest now. It's never been more clear. Um, we have the opportunity to create an economic stimulus for our community. Um, in addition, by employing folks on, on all of these rehabilitation projects. Um, so our kids need it, our community needs it, and uh, I'm excited to, to continue to bring this message to the community. And I want to thank JPEF um, for allowing this, these calls, for continuing the good fight with us, because it's hard to continue um, to have these conversations when there's so many other things pressing on our minds. So um, this is something we don't want to get lost in the loop. And I would ask everyone who's watching today, um, make sure that you're letting your networks know, because our children need it. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you. And I just want to take a moment to recognize your leadership on this issue. I know many school board members in the past have been aware of the increasing urgency of, of this issue. And it's only in the last two years that we've had a consensus in the leadership we needed to move toward action. So we really are so grateful for your advocacy for children on this issue. Thank you, Rachel. You know, this was a platform issue for me when I was running for um, school board in 2018. Um, as a mental health counselor and who's, as someone who taught in our school system, um, I really see the overlap in how this impacts our children's social emotional needs and their well being. Um, and, and making sure that the environments are developmentally appropriate um, and, and accessible for all students all across the district. Thank you, we really appreciate you. And thank you for joining us right before our commencement. <laughs> thank <was> a you. <laughs> um, 
Um, well, excellent. Well, we have one more speaker tonight. Um, and as we prepare to hear from him, we want to turn to your questions. So I want to ask you again, if you have questions that haven't been raised, please share them with us. We'll do our best to get to as many as possible tonight. But as has been um, stated throughout the call, this is not the last call. So um, whatever we can't get to tonight, hopefully we'll be able to cover in subsequent calls as well. Uh, and with that, I want to kick it to my colleague, Stephanie Gary Garfunkel of the JPEF team to bring the questions uh, to our three speakers tonight, our own Elizabeth Krajewski, Vice Chair Anderson, and, um, and Mr. Voss. Thank you so much, Rachel. I just wanted to jump in because I know um, Vice Chair Anderson has to run, um, but the number one question we're getting is people are just trying to understand how the funds are going to be shared between traditional public schools and charter schools. Um, and if, um, and, and one, uh, Cleep Warren has asked, you know, if, if they're going on the basis of student enrollment to charter schools, what accountability measures there are in place to make sure that those funds are used appropriately. So um, I wonder, Vice Chair Anderson, you probably answered this question a few times before. Could you share a little bit about that? And then Elizabeth Krajewski, if you could add anything else. Sure, thank you. Um, so yes, the legislation that was passed this past session, um, I wanna say it's it was in the, the tax package, 202161, I think if I remember correctly, um, does outline sharing capital sort of tax dollars with charter schools based on enrollment. Um, and so those dollars will go based on FTE, as Elizabeth um, outlined for us before. And um, the charter schools will have to turn in a report on how those monies are used. Um, charter schools have to provide all of their financial reporting to the school district. Um, but one of the key components that I think is really important here, is not only for the charter schools, but for our public schools as well, we've already got policy in place that sets up an oversight committee. Um, and that oversight committee will not only oversee the um, projects for the district, but it'll also oversee and the, these reports that are coming in um, from our charter schools. There's a very specific, just like we have to follow their specific things um, based on the uh, referendum and the language in the referendum that we can use these dollars for. And so the oversight committee is gonna make sure that um, there's some transparency and accountability to the public that everyone is spending the dollars the way that we have promised to spend them to the taxpayer. And my addition would just be um, that the financial reports that both charter and traditional schools are required to file each year, um, those reports are actually tied to a charter school's contract. So they could potentially be non-renewed or lose their opportunity to be a school um, if there's any type of fraud or financial misuse found. Um, so that's also built into those statutory provisions through the reporting requirements. Great, so I wanna turn now to a great question from Monique Tux and Jay McGovern who are asking questions sort of along the same line here, which is that if funding has been decreasing since 2008, why haven't we looked at an impact tax or a millage increase or have we looked at those options and decided not to pursue them? Um, and Jay McGovern is asking, why did we lose $300 million in education funding? What have Florida legislators and the governor said to defend this action? We have the third largest enrollment behind California and Texas. And I'll, I'll start, uh, Vice Chair doesn't hate to put you in the hot seat again, but let's start with it's, you on that one. That's fine, thank you. Um, okay, so first, have we talked about this before? Have we talked about trying to get any additional funding? Yes, it was brought up before um, with the previous superintendent and the school board. Um, they decided it was not an appropriate time to move forward with that. This superintendent came in and brought it to this, this school board, which is a new school board with a new superintendent. Um, and we decided that um, it was really, it's now or never. We're at a critical place um, and it, it wasn't gonna be getting any better unless we went to the community and asked for some help. Um, and so where has the money been going? So in 2008, um, the amount that the school system is able to collect in millage dropped from two mills to one and a half mills. Um, over time, that's really created um, an erosion of those capital dollars. And so um, that's, that's, where it's, that's where it's gone. Um, we, we've never been able to restore our funding um, from 2008. And here we are, you know, 12 years later. And again, we're looking at another big economic hit. So um, it is critical now more than ever. And certainly if anybody wants to mention to the state that we haven't refunded or restored our funding um, since pre-recession levels, I would be happy to make sure that you have those emails and you can reach out to those folks. 
And I would jump in to add to, um, as Vice Chair Anderson mentioned, you know, Duval County doesn't have impact fees. And one of the challenges I think even if we did is that impact fees can only go so far as new construction and new development. It can't be used for any historic needs, which a lot of our school buildings need with their age. Um, so that is a limitation. And then as I mentioned, with the size of Duval County um, and that need requirement, it's very, very often to prove that capacity is needed because we could always bus a student 20, 30 minutes away um, to a different school that has the capacity. And so we're, we have a challenge meeting the threshold required by the state um, to trigger some of those other things uh, to access funding as well. And before I move on to the next question, I just want to pause. David Voss, I know you're also very well informed on these. Is there anything you'd add to that? Well, the one thing I want to make clear is Duval County is the only major school district in the state of Florida without either one impact fees or sales. The ability, uh, which, which puts us at a disadvantage to other districts. And if we really want to reimagine uh, Duval County Public Schools, this has to be a piece of that action. You know, I just think, you know, the question was why? The recession hit in 2008 and the cuts were made at that time uh, because of reductions in income. But the, the unwillingness, I guess, to then increase it back uh, was basically the, the, the uh, conservative political sentiment during those next 10 years. Uh, we just feel that we've got to do it. The other big issue, I think, of course, that we're going to get pushback on in the, in the campaign is that it's bad timing. Uh, that because of the economic uh, downfall, we shouldn't be trying to pass it at this time. Our response is there's no better time. We absolutely have to have this. So a very small contribution from the individual will be an economic stimulus package for our community. Uh, and so by all contributing a certain amount, we can do this. I know Ms. Anderson, you're about to go to graduation. So uh, we can let you go and uh, maybe I can finish up with my piece of this. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I am I'm sorry to have to, to, to ditch here, but the superintendent is here. They're waiting on me. And so I think we're about to start the procession. Thank you all again so much. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions for folks if you, if you need it. Um, I am always accessible. So take care. Thanks. Thank you, um, Vice Chair Anderson. We really appreciate you. So one more question I just wanted to take for, I think Elizabeth Krajewski maybe can answer this one. Um, a great question from Lily Exantis about technology. Um, and then we can turn to David Voss. And we also have a great question here about the campaign and when that gets underway. So I'll let you address that, David, when we get to your remarks. But um, Elizabeth, if you could speak, of course, you know, now with virtual learning happening and potentially school closures again, if if um, schools are experiencing uh, virus exposure, um, would, this, uh, would this half penny revenue support technology, Wi-Fi, hotspots, equipment? Absolutely. So <clears throat> I, I can't remember if it was one of our principals or Vice Chair Anderson mentioned um, that one of the investments is also related to technology infrastructure. So a lot of times that means connectivity, uh, broadband and capacity and all of those really, really um, compli complicated uh, technological terms. Uh, but the district does have a plan to more fully implement laptops across the district to get to uh, more of that one-to-one, -one, you know, one laptop, one device per student ratio. Um, but the challenge, of course, is funding that and, and getting more equipment and getting new equipment. Um, the other piece of that, I think, goes to how teachers use technology um, and, and the kind of restraint that they have had in being able to kind of implement new technological tools in the classroom because they simply can't connect uh, to the needed capacity at their school. Um, so I think that there is a lot uh, of flexibility and I'm sure David could probably also add on to that as well um, that can be accomplished through that capital investment in, in terms of technology. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, with that, we're just so grateful to you, David Voss, again, the communications consultant for DCPS, who has many years of experience communicating complex issues to a broad audience of constituents. 
um, David reminds us that it's so important that we reach out to others to share what we've just learned on this issue. Uh, because this is on the ballot in the general election, we know a huge swath of Duval County will be deciding on this. Um, and many are still unfamiliar or, or uninformed about it. So you will play an important role in the community and that's why we're so glad to have you with us. David will help us think strategically about how you can reach out to share this information with others. David? Well, thanks so much. And, and you can just see on the slide here, I'm going to be brief because I know we're almost out of time and I want to answer that one more question, but I want to start by a word of caution. Um, so I've worked on 15, 16, 17 of these. I've passed three of them with Dr. Green and we are in for a fight. I don't want the polls to cause apathy or for people to have be overconfident. Um, frankly, it is easier to defeat a referendum than it is to pass it. People only need one reason to vote no. They need multiple reasons to vote yes. And you guys have just done an outstanding job of giving all the reasons to vote yes. But we've got a lot more people to cover. Uh, and so if anyone on this call isn't convinced, I don't know what it would take. Uh, and I hope that that means you're chomping at the bit to do something. Now our timing is interesting because of COVID. Uh, we have decided not to really go public with this too much until after we get kids back to school. That's just because of the distraction, uh, because that's the focus of the district and the priority of the district right now, along with graduations. So we're gonna really launch our informational campaign from the district a week or so after school starts. And the same thing with Duval Citizens for Better Schools, which is the political action committee that's going to be run the campaign. And I wanna remind people who really wanna get involved in the campaign, the political campaign, to go to Duval CBS, stands for Citizens for Better Schools, DuvalCBS.com. And that's where you'll learn about how to donate, how to get signs and participate in rallies. In the meantime though, my job today was to help you spread the word. And I tried to maybe come up with a little acronym here uh, with the word spread. And it is first about staying informed. Uh, with uh, our district website, you can get all of your questions answered, at least most of them. Certainly the questions that have been asked today are also answered on that website, along with, of course, the Jacksonville Public Education Fund site, which did that outstanding study on the connection between facilities and student achievement and follow on social media. But the next thing is to post. We do expect and anticipate largely a social media campaign. Just whatever your network is, whether it's two people or 200,000 people, we all have followers, but not only post information about the, the, uh, about the referendum, but ask people to share, literally ask them to share, because that's how things will go viral. So include in your information, please share, and then it can really spread the word. And we've got to right the wrongs. So during any kind of campaign like this, and we've seen it even more in the last four years, uh, all of the false information, uh, that is out there, the rumors and whatnot. If you see or hear information that you know now because of this webinar and the information you're reading is not true, correct it. Put it right away in the comments that it needs to be corrected. Uh, register to vote, of course. Uh, actually, it's, it's a little scary that a lot of people still are not registered to vote. People who would normally support us, our own staffs, uh, our own friends and neighbors and parents, be sure to register and ask others to do the same. We also all have email databases. Uh, go ahead and send out emails as you get this information to your database, uh, maybe collected in the smaller groups, so it's somewhat personal, but please feel free to go ahead and start emailing your, to your database the things that you're hearing. Believe me, hearing from a friend, a trusted source, somebody that they already know is a lot more powerful than hearing from us who they, or there's some detachment, or from the school board even, where you've got a mixed bag of credibility from history. Uh, this school board has, I agree, has been wonderful. But again, there are trust issues out there with a lot of people. So hearing from a friend, a neighbor, or a family member is really far more powerful. And take action. Uh, that, again, is going to be more in September and October. Action is meaning get the sign in the yard, make a donation, participate in rallies, et cetera. Uh, and donate. Uh, again, do, DuvalCBS.com. My colleague, Tom Nolan, who has a similar position as mine for the uh, Citizens for Better Schools that I have for the district, we've worked together on a number campaign, all successfully, I'm proud to say, 
uh, and I'm sure he would love to hear from all of you as well. So this is how to spread the word, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Excellent, thank you, David. Um, and in the interest of time, I just want to quickly run through a quick call to action because, as David said, there are so many ways that uh, we want to get you all um, sort of active in the campaign effort. Uh, we can't leave then without giving you guys some concrete opportunities. So we want to ask you to invite your friends to join our next call. We'll be sharing that information shortly and ask you to please share far and wide. Uh, we're really grateful to be working in partnership and close coordination with the Duval Citizens for Better Schools. Um, so we want to ask you to display one of our new car clings that's been provided by the PAC. Uh, and if you're interested in receiving a car cling, you can contact my colleague Dryden Mills at dryden at jackspeff.org to schedule a time to pick one up at our office downtown. We um, have um, are also coordinated with the PAC to receive yard signs that you can uh, display in your yard starting in September. So let us know um, if you're interested in that as well. We also have an action toolkit that you can use to help spread the word on social media, as David just explained. Um, and we invite you to please then visit jackspeff.org forward slash vote for some shareable graphics that you can use to let others know that you're supporting our schools and that they can too. We also ask you to please visit our partners' websites to learn even more. You can see master plans for all schools at the Duval County Public Schools informational site, ourduvalschools.org, to get involved in the political campaign, Duval Citizens for Better Schools. So please visit duvalcbs.com for that information. Um, one quick action that you can take following this call, we did live stream on Facebook, our research presentation. So ask you to go ahead and share that information with those in your network and encourage them to do so as well. And with that, I just wanna thank you all so much again for joining us tonight. We know these are tumultuous times for many families and it speaks to your commitment to our students and our future that you've taken time to join us tonight. So please have a wonderful evening and we look forward to connecting with you about our next steps together. Good night.